charting an unfamiliar course and determined to fulfill their destiny. I had no idea that I would be an inventor. Six African-American inventors make groundbreaking contributions to the toy and game industry. So that's two different things. All right. So, th so they have the ability to move within zones, you're saying? <laughs> With the steady cam. I would prefer to get a, a conference room that has these screens on both sides of the room so viewing is comfortable for everybody. I'm assuming it works. Good camera. Hmm? The stories of black inventors are important because they raise awareness of the excellent scientific achievements that have been literally ignored in the American education system. That new awareness will change attitudes and perceptions about the scientific potential of our black youth. People of all ages and races should be re-educated quick, fast, and in a hurry. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I won't bother you anymore. Only person that he's ever freaked out about that much was Sean Connery. So. <laughs> okay, man. So they say you can judge a man by the company he keeps. That means all of you must be together. Outstanding. That's true. Come on over. Come on over. Take a picture with these great guys. Sit right where I'm at. We should have a sense of urgency about the need to train black youth right in, the in the sciences to prepare them for the STEM careers of the future. The stories of black inventors will inspire our youth and motivate them to raise their aspirations to become scientists, engineers, and inventors. This will improve American life for us all. Black Adventures got game, scene one, take one. My, my professional career had been working for the government, you know, NASA, Air Force, and things like that. So Super Soaker allowed me to, you know, strike out on my own by my freedom, as I like to refer to it. Mm -hmm. um, so creating uh, the Super Soaker, creating inventions, I think is a path to um, achieve success. When you're young, you're kind of groomed to believe what is told to you from your elders or, or from anybody. Like, you know, kids are sponges, you know? So when they're told that they can't do something, it really has a, it could have a detrimental effect. My form of racism came by way of colorism. You know, like, that was my first experience of being black, being different. I was told by my aunt at five years old, like, I, I should not be playing with my cousin Demetrius because he was, he was light-skinned, right? So mm -hmm. right down the middle at five years old, I'm thrusted right into this mix of colorism. Ironically, it really prepared me for, for the racism that I would encounter later on. It was like, it was almost nothing. My experience was something similar to what you said. I had a cousin or have a cousin who was more dark-skinned than I am. And when I first got into Kmart, that was one of the comments he said. He thought that he would not have achieved the acceptance and success that I achieved because he was darker skinned than I was. And it just kind of blew me away when he told me that. And some of the doubters and naysayers were my own family and friends. Not that they didn't think I could achieve success, but the experience of racism that they experienced 
yeah. the colored their view of yes. whether or not yes. I could be successful. Yes. My father, who grew up in uh, Mississippi in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, he experienced all that racism, you know, uh, white only this and white only that and that sort of thing. And fortunately, though, he never planted that doubt in my mind. Since the age of 12, Ken has been on an inventor and entrepreneurial journey that has sustained him for more than 50 years. He tells of an amazing story about his first bout with success. The shorter story is I went about producing a baseball game, a board game that I created when I was 12 and actually started to try to market that game when I was 19. So uh, after a year or two of going through various efforts to get that game on the market, I eventually did. Only to find it being a temporary one. Well, it didn't do very well in the marketplace. Uh, after three or four months, I was told that uh, it was going to be cut by Kmart, which was the distributor of the game at the time. Not to be derailed, Ken decides to try a new product idea. Well, Phase 10 will be celebrating its 40th anniversary uh, next year. It wasn't until 20, 25 years later when Phase 10 was doing well and, and being distributed worldwide that one day he says to me, he said to me, he said, he always called me man. So he says, man, you know, you were very lucky that that buyer at Kmart apparently wasn't a racist. I, he said, I was very fearful that he would be a racist and would not bring your game in. And I thought, I'm glad he didn't tell me that <laughs> when I was going to call on Kmart. Right. Yes. Because it would have planted this thing in my mind yes. that might have colored, or I shouldn't say colored, but, <laughs> 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 but cha yeah, changed my perspective, yeah. right? Uh, the possibilities and, and caused me to think, OK, this is going to be an issue. When he told me that later on, I was so grateful he didn't say that to me before I went there. And, uh, but yeah, it was, his concern was that the racism that he experienced would affect my ability to get that game launched. In terms of swimming upstream, doing things that people you know, say you can't do, you know, I mean, that's just been um, my blessing or my curse, however you want to look at it. But there are just so many things outside of your control, so many things that can go wrong. Mm -hmm. Racism is just one of them but I chose not to acknowledge it. What Africans can do, Africans have done. Uh, and it just made me think of that when you said, when people always try to tell us what we can or can't do. When this comes out, when word gets out to, to people who don't know who you are or that, that you, you brothers have invented all of the things that you've invented, they're gonna say, wow, like this is gonna be some kind of new phenomenon to them that it's black faces that made these things when the truth is, this is not new. What you guys have done is not new at all. When Soup Soaker first came out, it was actually called Drencher. And I had a friend there who had, whose wife was teaching school, and they invited me to come to their class and, and um, you know, talk to the kids about inventing and about the Super Soaker and everything. And so I took the gun and went in, and I'm in front of the class, I'm talking. And these, of course, were all black kids, and they looked at me and said, you didn't do that. <laughs> you didn't do that. Some white, some, you, know, you didn't do some white man in a big factory did that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know? it's, it's, it's like saying a magic not, trick. They don't I'm, believe it. And I'm, I'm not sure to this day if I ever convinced them. <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's not that brothers can't or sisters can't get into the toy industry. It's that they don't have the foundation or the, the knowledge to even understand how to even get into the door, let alone where that door is. Like, they don't even know. What's interesting about that is that, you know, just listening to you, it's very obvious to us that there are blacks in the music industry. There are blacks in the sports industry. Yeah. And so we have kids who are aspiring to be in sports and in music, but they don't see us in the more cre other creative industries. Wow. And uh, I think exposing that um, will be, it's very important because they, you know, what they see they will be. It's not unusual for black people to be involved in something great, you know? What I'm hoping will happen for us is that we will have more confidence in ourselves.
and our community will have more confidence in us. One other point I want to make um, that I want to really kind of talk about since I'm a little bit older than most people in this room is that back in the 50s, it was difficult to get a job in any corporation for a black person. Remember, mm -hmm. remember we, had, we had grandfathers and fathers who had PhDs that were working in the post office. Mm -hmm. And for your father to try to get into Sears at that time was an was a enormous type of thing. The head of the design department at, at, the, at that moment, who was really kind of uh, unusual as, as, a, as an executive or a boss, he actually did, he sat, sat, sat down with my dad and said, look, I, I'll just tell you how it is. Uh, I like your work, but... Unfortunately, Sears has this unwritten rule where we just can't hire you. What our parents were trying to do was protect us. Get yourself a secure job, go to the post office, or go to a corporation that's going to give you a pension, right? But then there would be somebody in the family that would listen to what we were saying, like my older brother said to my parents, no, let him go off and do his own thing. My father had a similar kind of experience. Chuck's only sibling was his brother Lawrence, who was nine years older than him. Growing up, Chuck looked up to Lawrence and thought his brother was seriously smart, a genius you might say. Chuck, on the other hand, had trouble reading and was not a strong student in the traditional academic areas. It was decades later when he was diagnosed with dyslexia that it became clearer why he had so much trouble in school. By the time Chuck graduated from high school at the age of 16, Lawrence was living in Oakland. He invited Chuck to come to the Bay Area for college, and Chuck took him up on the offer. By the age of 17, Chuck was enrolled in San Francisco City College. He started out as an economics major and quickly felt the sting of his challenges at school. By the end of his first semester, he was on academic probation. Stepping in to help, Lawrence encouraged Chuck to take a course in vocational guidance. Enrolling in this course was a true game changer. The class included exercises and assignments to help identify where a student might excel. Chuck learned that he would do well in art, but he knew telling that to his parents would be a non-starter. He imagined his dad's reaction, telling him, if you want to be a painter, I've got a garage you can work on. Chuck investigated his options further and learned about opportunities in product design. This newfound direction and focus were the boost his academics needed. He quickly went from flunking out to the honor roll, graduating in two years and eventually enrolling at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago, where he took up a career that would chart his journey to success. Lawrence was really instrumental in helping him to find his path. Uh, that's really the ultimate thing. I know he was very concerned about how he was going to get his parents on board uh, <laughs> with art school. I, if, fortunately, they, they he, he was able to get a, a the state of Texas had some kind of a, a scholarship for African Americans who they'd send them they'd pay for them to go out of state because they didn't want them going to the <laughs> University of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how my father was able to pay to go to the Control the uh, art institute but I like that. I, I think his father parents supported him they were they were still nervous with that support whatever that understanding was or that support I I I myself benefited from it my from my father it, it was still hard for me it in, in the 1980s to want to say, uh, yeah, I want to go study music. <laughs> I, there were so many, uh, even family friends said, why, why don't you just, just keep that as a hobby? Why, get, get, get you a, why don't you get, get a real get, job. Get, get, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. job at the post office, right. I mean, I think back 40 years ago when I was in elementary school, you know, career days only involved about four careers. You know, there's four things you, you were, uh, you know, be the teacher, be a policeman, and doctor and lawyer. That harkens back to my childhood as well. Um, uh, it, it was just a television show. It was Mission Impossible. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
this gentleman named Greg Morris had my last name, but he was the mastermind behind a lot of the things that they did. I saw that happen. It was a black man, and he had my last name, and so I couldn't help but notice him. Mentorship plays a great role. Now, in my, in my particular case, I didn't see physically the people in front of me. That's why it's so important when I go out to these schools. I think the biggest thing that happens is they look at the game, but they look at me. They can see something that they've never seen before, which makes it makes them curious. Mentorship is so important because you open, your, you open up people's minds to the world around them that they never saw. When I was a child, um, I was curious. I got interested in uh, rockets. And so I started researching rockets and I learned how to make rocket fuel. At age 10, this daredevil quality found Lonnie showing interest in rocket fuel on his mom's kitchen stove. Things did not go so well. Lonnie quickly began to panic as he anticipated his fate when his dad would come home. He recalls rushing to his bedroom to put on a second pair of pants as a way to help dampen blows he was destined to receive to his rear end. Much to Lonnie's surprise, his dad received the news quite well, suggesting to Lonnie that he experiment outside from now on, and he bought him a portable stove. As far as his mom, now that was another story. Lonnie quipped, I did remodel her house, Flames were shooting up out of the pot. I knew I was going to get destroyed when my daddy got home. So <laughs> I put on two pair of pants and um, waited patiently. And he got home, he looked at me, and he looked at the pot. And he says, you're going to have to do that outside from now on. And he bought me a hot plate. That and that was amazing. the beginning, the end of it. You know, he never, he was always supportive. Um, I used to watch him repair things around the house. So he was my first source of inspiration, actually. Mm -hmm. My mom was, was is, is, to this day, is still instrumental in my growth. Um, she was a big pop culture fan, you know, a big lover of art, and just she had a curious mind. So when I came around, she um, fostered that curiosity. So I think that my mom always, always pushed that, to be different, you know, and be okay with being different. It's okay to be you and whatever you it is you know a lot of his work as an educator was really on giving young people the confidence right. the foundation that they could actually pursue this thing and if they stuck with it if they were persistent if they worked on their craft they could become excellent and successful at it i think a lot of young people are really feeling themselves right now mm -hmm. they're realizing that there are opportunities that were not available to us Mm -hmm. um, that are available to them. There's an opportunity to be able to provide a support network to intentionally create a space for that to happen. You know, I grew up in Alabama. Um, I personally experienced that white only and right on the back mm -hmm. of the bus and all of these things as a child. So that, that's part of my life. But you know, in our community, we, I never heard the word entrepreneur. I heard mm -hmm. hustler. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that. Um, but, uh, you know, there was not a lot of wealth in our community. There was nobody on the other side who wanted to see you succeed, who wanted to help make it a reality and have a part of it. That's changing. That's changing. Yeah, now the youth are definitely, they are audacious now. It's like they're not sitting around. They've, they've watched us march, and they've watched us protest, and they've watched everything. And now they're like, we're moving into action now. Like we have the resources, and if I can't, if I don't have the resources, I'm going to go to YouTube and figure it out on my own. Now that we have, we're at this this impasse where it's like we have this technology, we have this passion, we have this visibility. It's like, let's how do we harness all of that? You know, a lot of the the mindsets of the children that I go and talk to about entrepreneurship is still along the lines of hustler, but they think that a hustler is someone to be admired. They think mm -hmm. a hustler is someone that goes out and yes. makes it happen and do and does all of these things. And, you know, um, with myself, there was a distinct time when I made a difference between, you know, I grew up in the South Bronx. So, you know, it was a distinct time when I made a difference between a hustle and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was the growth that let me know that entrepreneurship was so much more. Elliot speaks of a day in his childhood at age eight Elliot. where he was awakened by his mom to go to Sunday school. Elliot. 
It's time to get up for Sunday school. Only to feign an illness. He recalls when his mom had left for church that day. He arose from his bed only to turn his attention to the family radio, an item that by his admission he was fascinated with. Elliot recalls on this day succumbing to his curiosity and taking the entire radio apart, only to look up at the clock to notice that his mom would soon be returning home from church. After a failed attempt to fumble with the components and rush the parts back together and a very disappointed Elliot. mom, Elliot soon discovered that a career in working with his hands was not exactly in the cards. Not to be dismayed, a few years later, Elliot would turn his attention to comics, where he recalls in 1980 designing his series of Spider-Man comic books only to have his friends jeer and laugh at such a feeble attempt. Though denied by his fellow buddies, such rejection by his peers only fueled Elliot's resolve as a budding entrepreneur. And the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, I think that perseverance, oh my goodness, it, it's probably one of the most important things that we can have because things are going to go wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, things are going to get sideswiped. People are going to step in your way. Uh, but you have to be able to say, no matter what, uh, there's still life for me in this and I can still push through and I can accomplish something whether nobody else in this world believes it or not. But you have to stay in the game. The change is being made, but I still think that, you know, people like us who, who have the experience of going back and growing up in certain times in the 80, you know, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and even beyond that, uh, we have a responsibility to help these young people understand really what the fullness of entrepreneurship is and what the possibilities are now, and then allow them to run with the ideas of what it can be in the future. Yeah, I, I would add to that, you know, that the idea of also contextualizing it in, the, in what they live in, what they have access to, right? Like right now, I could go downstairs to my laptop and I could make a song. I could go outside and at you know at the Capitol building and I could do a dance to that song and lay, layer over some artwork on it. I could go down, you know, like and, and so like my output is immediate to your point, right? So how do we translate the values and the experiences that folks like us have being of, of older generations? But in the context of what they have access to now, because it, 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 none of us had the access to, like you brought it up. I, I mean, you actually helped open access up to, to at, by nature of what your product is, right? So how do we contextualize what we are doing, what, what we are saying, and the value of what we have done and what you have all have done, and then say, yes, I want to translate to you, youth. However, I also see that you have this path, this tool. This is a tool. Technology is a tool. It is not, it is not the product, right? And technology is a tool with which we can use, similar to what we were talking about with the Viewmaster, right? It's a tool to take us into the world of 3D, the universe, right? So how do, how do we like really help them understand what was at their disposal and, and yet offer the advice and the, the knowledge of what it really takes to make something successful. I think though that one of the things that I'm hearing in this conversation that is maybe implicit, <laughs> um, but Lonnie, you talked about it, is that we, I think a fundamental aspect of this is being able to help our young people to understand how to capture the value that they're creating. Uh, because the fact of the matter is that in many instances, they're not aware of how these you were talking about this earlier with the toy industry, how a toy gets produced, right? How, where does the idea come from? What's the trajectory that, that it has to go along to be able to get to the point where it's in someone's hands? And what is your part in that? What's your stake in it? And how can you actually capture that value? It's, so many of our young people are, are aspiring to that in the same way that we think about young people aspiring to play sports or what have you without uh, actually understanding the business aspect of it and how to capture value is there as they're building something. Last couple of years, we've seen a social like, upheaval of knowledge 
and awareness outside of our community that is that is, is is different than any other time. I think if you think about it in terms of pandemic or whatever you want to do, but the rise of Black Lives Matter, the idea of underrepresented people and value that they actually that, that underrepresented people bring to any industry is is now of more of a focus. And so I would say then the other thing is the commercial place, right? Then the commercial place means I'll call it the Wakanda effect, right? So Black Panther comes out. Pro, most pro-black, uh, you know, uh, mainstream movie of all time. Celebrates black technology, black excellence, and what is it? It's one of the highest grossing Marvel movies, right? So the, the marketplace was there. And for the eye of Sauron, for, to use the Lord of the Rings, saw, said, said, oh wow, opportunity is there now. Now, but then you tie that in with the social piece, Right? And put, put those things together, you start to think like, well, from the toy industry perspective, like I, I'm, I run diversity, equity, and inclusion for Mattel. I spent 11 years as a designer there. One of the, I became one of the, you know, the most senior black person in development, product development. But I, in the last year, I made a transition over to running DEI. I'm a toy guy who now runs DEI. And the, the focus is, from a company perspective, starts to look into, well, where do you recruit? So you open up your recruiting funnel. Retention means how do you develop that talent and actually putting the t that, the, that into words and to actions. Because I've been on a mission to do, to get to this point where I am right now. I know that I was in rooms that no one else was in. And I knew how to navigate the room. I was able to start to really be authentically myself and have that resonate. When I was hired, uh, when I, my first job, um, I'm usually in a room I'm usually the only black in the room. I've gotten the you can't to the I can't believe you did. Mm. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. As a representative of that, I think about, okay, if I'm Johnny Appleseed, I have 10 seeds, right? So I gotta help put them where they can go right now. So those trees that we're gonna plant, none of us are gonna climb them. The stories that you tell, are, are already changing from generation to generation. Now it's maintained to, to understand where we came from. We cannot, uh, we have to know where we came from so that we continue to grow upon it. And to your point, reflect back, mm -hmm. right? And so right now, the, the, it's seizing momentum. Seizing momentum is, is, is very important. And this project does that. This project does that, and this strengthens the, the reason to double down in investing in communities, in investing in, and the industry reinvesting on itself. We all know it, the toy, toy industry is, is small. It's a small number to begin with, so, it, and our representation is, is the lowest, as we would expect. However, there is, there, is mo there is momentum right now, and there's impetus to do this, and if we don't do it in the way that is full-fledged, honest, authentic, there's gonna be commercial money left on the table, there is a social value that's left on the table, and then there's the personal experience for everyone who's in it. In closing, I think it's very important to understand that there is opportunity. And part of the thing is, part of the thing is if somebody says something and say like, hey, I'm committed <coughs> to this, or you know, my door is always open. Well, that's one thing, but it's also incumbent to say, oh, let me test to see that door is open. Mm. Yeah. And that's that's what that's that's where I see the opportunity, and 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 that's that to me is empowerment. Mm. Well said, well said. I think we have literally left it all on this table, <laughs> indeed. And on that note, guys, it is a wrap. <laughs> <laughs>
the B-I-G-G, Big Film, will inspire kids to think big and grow their ideas. I'm really excited that our collaboration has resulted in the progress that you've made. It's unfortunate it's taken this long for your story and the story of the inventors that you are uh, bringing to light um, has taken so many years to, to get to this place. But clearly our industry's rallying around your efforts speaks volumes to the fact that we really do care and want to hear the stories. They're fascinating. I've been in this business for over 45 years and had no idea that our inventor pool was made up of so many people of color. And it's really exciting to see now that these stories are actually being told.